Perfect. All right. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead, but I'll come back to that that white text there because it is um, core to my my presentation today. Um, but I want to start with something that you guys have hopefully hopefully recognised, being not um, uh, a regular to Mount Isa. In fact, as of yesterday, I'd never been here. But I thought I'd put this in. Um, and really, what I wanted to show is that this one really large feature here um, that stands out in the in the aerial view. I want you to. I want to start with a couple of facts, and then possibly, and then how it relates to that that surface area. Um, if I held a solid handful of really fine soil particles, so this is the ultra fine stuff that I'm talking about. It's less than two microns. It's your clays, it's your iron oxides. A handful of that would have the surface area of the Mount Isa racetrack just in a handful. So a big area to cover. However, if I had a handful of soil that was you know, less than 250 micron, maybe 180, that's just pretty much your standard soil analysis that you do. So when you take your soil sample and send it into the lab, they'll sieve it down to that and then they'll, they might mill it and then digest it. But it's about that size fraction. That same handful has a surface area possibly the size of this room. So that's, that's a, quite a contrast in the surface area and absorptive capabilities. Now I want you to think a little bit more about if you were a weathering ore deposit, bear with me here, it's a little bit of a stretch. As you're moving through a transported cover, you're weathering down your charged gold, copper, if you have a dark side, you might be thallium. Um, <laughs> you're moving through this environment and you're looking for places to stick to. Are you more likely to hit the surface of this room or perhaps the Mount Isa race course? And that's really the, the impetus for why we developed this technique because really most of the stuff that's moving through these environments that you're interested in, your gold and copper, is charged and it's going to absorb to those surfaces. So we did this in an experiment out back of CSIRO just, just behind our building. This is in sand dunes, trans true transported cover. We buried ore in these child play pools, backfilled them and then started monitoring the surface. And I was sceptical that we would see a lot really quickly, but within seven months of burying those ore deposits, you can see the, the surface sampling, we were able to detect Soil geochemical anomalies in gold and base metals, this is uh, zinc and copper over the buried base metal ore. We were able to detect those within seven months over two metres of cover. And that reproduced, it was seasonal, it fluctuated a little bit, but it, but it was always there. What's really interesting and what I want to point out is this value up here. Now if that was in your geochemical sampling, you would be getting, that would be a false positive, classic, and it would really throw off your geochemistry. What I want to also point out is this next one, where that number's been removed, is because we've factored in organic carbon. So that's one of the other key criteria that has big absorptive capabilities, so clays and organics. But we've, you know, and I would challenge anyone in this audience that who has done a soil survey and then measured their organic carbon? Probably no one. I mean, we don't, even in research, we rarely do it. But these sorts of parameters that we need to understand better to interpret our geochemistry. And that's kind of why we've gone about developing the technique and providing more data to understand these anomalies. But it all starts for me um, in 2007. So I want to give you a little bit of a flavor for where this came from. In, in northern Spain, uh, I took a picture out of the bus window. And I was sitting on that same bus with uh, Paul Morris, who was the a retired chief geochemist at, at GSWA. And it was that moment where someone who's a, a mentor and, and someone quite senior to you takes a moment to actually ask you a question that really makes you think about where, you know, gets, gets your um, brain going a little bit and makes you think a bit more about your geochemistry. And for me, this, it was on this bus where Paul had been doing regional geochemical surveys and he turned to me and he, he, I remember he asked just one thing and it was, how, how fine should we go? And at that time, I, was, I, and I remember my response was, I think the finer the better. Um, and I was thinking, oh, the finest dry sieve, minus 61, that should become our new industry standard. Um, but little did I know that after that moment, Paul and I would work a lot more closely together. Um, and it really changed, changed the research direction for me and led to us doing this ultra fine, so the, the less than two micron. It's really just fine soils, but because people call fine soils less than 100, less than 70, which with ultrafine. But I want to talk about the issue and the opportunity first. And, and one of the challenges with surface geochemistry in particular over the last decade, and that's why I put the picture of the ponds in here, it relates to the idiom um, 
jumping the shark. Now, some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may not. Um, in TV terms, it's when, a, when your show is diving, you know, your ratings are down, things, pe people come back and they do something outlandish and over the top ridiculous almost to try and boost their ratings. And it doesn't work. And this, was the, this is the classic example they show with the Fonz on water skis jumping the shark. It was when Happy Days really died. But I think what's happened in surface geochemistry and near surface geochemistry is that it's stalled for the same reason. Over the past decade, we've had companies, black box <coughs> techniques, people saying, you, you'll see through 100 metres of cover with surface geochemistry. I, I don't really think it happens. Um, rarely does it happen. And not without really good reasons. And it's partly because surface geochemistry has really jumped the shark. I think there is a lot of opportunities in shallow cover though. And that's another point that I'd really like to um, get across to you today. And Mark Arundel gives a presentation. He, he's changed the name. Uh, it used to be called The Fallacy of the Deep. I think he's put a more positive spin on it now. And it's called Value in the Shallows. But what's really nice is that he takes the classic uh, Richard Shoddy present um, data that you, you, hopefully many of you have seen where depth of discovery is going deeper and deeper. And you know it, it's great for getting research grants and, and getting the government to fund you and saying you know we need to be through 100, 200 metres of cover. And that's definitely the case in, in some, some spaces. But for what um, Mark goes back to, he, he got the global data, and it's not the Australian data, so that might be a bit different. But he took the global data, took out near mine discoveries. So even though they were called new discoveries, they were near mine. So of course, you know, if you're in a hot zone, you're going to drill deeper next door. But if you go to a true greenfield setting, you're unlikely to go and put a bunch of deep tight, tight holes in. And so what he did was look at the, the data without the near mine discoveries, and then he filtered them and looked at the median depth, not the mean, because there are a couple of really deep discoveries that have really skewed this data. But if you look at the, so 50% of these discoveries in the last, um, I think, I don't know how many years he goes back, in terms of cover, the, the median depth is less than a metre. That's not a lot of cover globally, for gold deposits. For copper, it's less than 20 metres. So there is a lot of opportunity in shallow cover exploration, both in Australia and internationally, where we can do better. And that's really what I focus the old fine on. I don't, don't think it's these for 100 metres of cover, but I definitely think it does 10, 20 metres very, very effectively. And I'm not going to show a lot of results. Um, I like to get up and tell, tell a bit of a story. I don't really want to get stuck into the nitty gritty of the method development and all that, because it's all available. Um, so at the end of this presentation, I've got a QR code that comes up on the screen. Take a photo on your smartphone, it'll link you straight to this report if you want it. It's got the information on all the QAQC we did, all the little tests where we said, you know, do we need to analyse 0.2 of a gram versus 4 grams? Do we, is 2 microns better than 0.25 microns? So we went down into the nanometer scale of separating these out and doing the geochemistry. So it's all in there. If you want the information, you can get it. But the, the key points were that we were able to concentrate up the Pathfinder elements, and we haven't looked at a lot of them. We're really focused on gold and copper in this project because that was where the interest was from industry. Um, but, it, but up to about 300% increase in those, those elements. We were also able to show that the below detection samples for gold, and this was really important, and this is over a thousand samples that were, were tested that were below detection, or 67% of them were below detection for gold, so, um, yeah. and we reduced that to 10%. And we think we can get down to 1% really, really very quickly. Um, so that won't be a challenge in the future. There, and then the other big benefit of this project was that we were able to account for things in, in, in changes in soil properties that we hadn't done before. And I wasn't quite expecting this in some of the profile work we did. But uh, coming back to it, it actually made sense to me. Because, you know, and I'll give you the example with a, a, a classic, you know, that your fieldy is out sampling soils early in the morning. Um, he's gung-ho, he's been told to drill down to, you know, 50 centimetres with his auger. He's getting down to 50 centimetres and he's hitting a, cl a clay rich layer. That's his sample. After lunch, the temperature's kicked up into the high 30s. He's not feeling, not feeling it so much. He's only augering down 20 or 30 centimetres taking his soil sample. Now you have no control over that, but your geochemistry is going to be quite different because again, you're going to be getting a lot more perhaps sandier material in that near surface sample compared to the one that's slightly deeper. But what we're doing with this technique is, even if it's 45% clay at the bottom, we're still separating out that really fine fraction of clay. Even if it's 10% clay near the surface, we're still taking out that really fine fraction of clay. So we're comparing apples and apples in our geochemistry, and it's something that we haven't done very effectively. 
in the past. We don't get any nugget effect for gold, so again, we get rid of the nuggets. We don't get screaming anomalies, um, and it's not just my own work in this space. There's some really great work out of Canada looking at comparing the legs, different size fraction, and, and clay size fraction, which is essentially what this is. And it's not a paradigm shift. So even though the title says it's a transformative shift, it's not. None of this is new. It's just that we've packaged it together and made it easy to use. And so that's why it's in some ways the world first. But it's only because it's all packaged together where you can get it. Um, and often, I forget this, Lab West is the current provider in, w, in Australia, so you have to send it to Western Australia to get the analysis done. And it's about 60 to $70 per sample. Um, I always get that question when I give this presentation, and I forget. And I'll just show a couple of results, just, to, just so that you know I'm not just completely making this up, but it's all in the reports. You know, here's an example where we had about 10 metres of cover <coughs> east of Kalgoorlie, and you can see typical sort of orientation work. There was the target outlined in the dash to area, and it picks up a really nice, nice normal. It goes up about 175 PPB gold in this area. This was a gold target. Again, it wasn't very economic. This one is economic. This is the Degrusa deposit in Western Australia. Um, big copper um, sulphide body. And you see here's the oxide copper outline projected to the surface, and this is just one of the orientation lines. And you see a nice strong anomaly just as south. What's really good about this result is that that's actually, there's a slight slope there. So if you put that in regolith context and setting context, you would actually say, well, yeah, probably that makes sense. Really, uh, really picking out that target. Oh, don't hit that. And then this is another example where it's showing the benefit of reprocessing old historic examples. This was the survey's best quality work um, from only about, well, 10, 20 years, 15, 20 years ago, more now. 15 years ago. This is the edge of the Yilgarn margin heading into the northeast in the Arahidi Basin. Um, and what you see from 300 samples there, there's about 18 samples with data for gold that they can use to interpret. It doesn't pick out the only known mine deposit in the area. And four case basing. So again, it's broad, it's green fields. But when we took those exact same samples from the, from the core facility at GSWA, and just this is just the gold data. So we've got a lot more data to work with. But you can see now that there's a you know, you're strongly trending along the greenstone belts. Anything above five in this, this region is quite a strong result. And it does pick out the, the Mount Eureka deposit, but you can see possibly extensions of this greenstone belt trending up under, under the cover of the basin too. Again, not thick cover, but, but a lot more information. And then there's this result, which I really like. Um, this was in counter resources. This was immediate industry impact, I guess. Again, uh, south, southeast of Kalgoorlie, um, maybe 50 k's or so, um, maybe a bit more. They had three samples in this survey that had detectable gold. One was right at the detection limit of about one ppb, um, and two other samples just above. So not a lot of work, not a lot of information to work with. They went back, they took a few more samples, but then they reprocessed them with the ultrafine plus. And this was, you know, just just they did it on their own back. I didn't have anything to do with this. Um, and then this was the target they generated. You know, a nice, strong, multi-point anomaly um, up to about oh, that's it, 27 ppb in that case. But it's nice and coherent, really good target. And then they drilled it. Oh, sorry, I thought I had another slide. And found nothing. So, you know, you might be thinking, you know, Roman, you've jumped up here on your soapbox, you're telling us all this great stuff about it, and then you're showing us a whopping great big false positive. What I think is really important, though, is this is where industry and researchers have, have have, I guess, by either time demand or pressures, have walked away from this sort of information and said, well, it didn't work. But they haven't gone back and said, what other information do we have in this space that could have explained this better? And that's where I think the real power is, is with, with the ultrafine workflow, is that you get a whole lot more information to make better informed decisions about this. And where we're going with this in the future is to explain false positives quite strongly. So, you know, was things like the clay rate, clay, diff, clay type differences in those in that anomaly, was the hematite girthite ratio different? All these sorts of parameters that you can start to look at that we don't. Was the pH different? I mean, pH is a master variable for soil chemistry, yet we rarely look at pH. Um, maybe it was, and I don't, I don't know. We haven't actually done that work yet. So traditionally, we get the suite of elements, and that's that's all very good with whatever technique you choose to do. Ultrafine Plus does exactly the same thing. It's a suite of elements, you get the elemental data, um, and you can work with that. 
But then on top of that, this is where I think we're getting a lot more benefit is by adding more information. So you get particle size distribution, pH, conductivity, spectral mineralogy. So this is the, the, the TSG software some of you might be familiar with. We're starting to put those bits of information in there so you can make <coughs> decisions or make a better understanding about perhaps your anomalies based on that. And then a little descriptor that tells you what those parameters are. That's, that's the basis at the moment. You can send your samples off right now to, Alt to LabWest and get that done. But the, and that's not the paradigm shift. I think what, what is going to be the shift is what we can do with that information. And we can do a lot more. And we can add a lot more parameters. So we're going to add in organic carbon, for example, as a, as a proxy. And that's where the solution comes in and the title of my slide um, presentation with the paradigm shift. This is Thomas Kuhn. He's the, uh, the American philosopher, science philosopher, who wrote in 1962 a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And he coined the phrase, the paradigm shift. Um, and paradigm shifts, he took, breaks them down into different ones. Like there's, there's, there's a lot of different examples. But in mineral exploration, what, these paradigm shifts aren't so obvious. They're kind of, um, well, they are obvious, but they're um, confined to a small, small group compared to some of the bigger ones like plate tectonics that you'd be very familiar with. Um, and the, the concept of the paradigm shift is, is really that, you know, I, I know this is where I think this is a Wittgenstein diagram that they use a lot. Um, you know, for, for the past decades, you know, exploration, near surface geochemistry has been saying, here's your elemental data, just interpret it as you, as you see, you know, that's, that's what you're working with. And, you know, everyone's saying, well, these, these results look to the left, to the, sorry, left of screen, it's, it's all duck geochemistry. And what I think we're about to do is change the way we think about our data by incorporating a whole lot more parameters, different ways of thinking about it, the machine learning, which has been talked about yesterday a little bit and, and continues to be talked about. That's where we start bringing in all these other different things to try and understand our data differently. And that's where industry and research as a whole start looking at this from the other side, from the right hand side and saying, well, hang on, no, this, this, is, a, this is a rabbit now. And that's that shift that we need going, going forward. And how we'll do that is by, the beauty of Ultrafine Plus is that the format is all in one, one style. So as you put your data through, it comes back in the same, same style. One of the biggest problems with machine learning is getting your data into a format that you can all work with. This is all set up because the process just puts the data in that way. So, but we're looking to leverage that um, against bigger and interoperable data. So that's why the surveys are all in, most of the surveys are involved with this. GSQ is certainly involved. And it's because we're going to use spatial data in, in our interpretation as well. We're going to explain false positives or, and we're not going to explain all false positives, but we're certainly going to do a, a better job of that. And we're going to make decisions using uncertainty. It's a really powerful um, possibility for the future is not where, you know, gut feel works. Um, don't get me wrong, there's, there's certainly a place for it. But being able to look at something in your data and say, well, I had a gut feeling that this was a really interesting area. But all of a sudden you've got some other information that backs up your assumption and you can say, well, actually, I've got numbers to back it up. And uncertainty is also a good thing to where you can go, well, hang on, we don't actually understand that area very well and we need to go back there and look. Or we need to walk away and understand our risk. Generate targets better and, as I've said, you know, exploration through cover will be improved. And I don't think this is necessarily the paradigm shift, but the concept of combining your geochem data with a whole lot of other parameters and doing better interpretation is where I think that shift will come from. And so the future is sort of interpreting that in landscape and, uh, and context. So using soil types, using all these other maps and things we have at our disposal to interpret our geochemistry and making that really easy to use. And we're coming at this from two different perspectives. One is uh, blending uh, the human expertise. So there's a lot of great work in surveys, in industry, CSIRO, that, been done where people have said, you know, some of these parameters work for exploration, but they kind of get buried in reports. We're going to pull those out and try and make those columns of data that we can look at. But I say columns of data, that's for further inter interpretation. But there's also going to be an easy visual way to look at that data. And then there's a machine learning response. We're going to throw all this in, into different, different uh, machine learning methods and see what comes out. Some of it will be junk. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Uh, there's going to be some rubbish that comes out of it. But there's going to be something in there that maybe you then tweet, um, piques your interest and you go back to that data and have a look at it closer. We're not going to disrupt the way you do your work. Um, 
you'll still submit your samples to the lab just like you would for anything else. You just tick a box, you say you want the Ultra Fine Plus, and then the, the future of this project is you'll tick a box that says, I want these additional data products and machine learning. Then all you'll do in about three weeks once your analysis is done, you'll log on to, the, to a web platform and you'll see things like this, geotiffs of all those different parameters and you'll be able to quickly flick through those and get an understanding. Yes, and again, some of these will, be, will jump. You might be, this might be your area of interest down here. But some of them might be really interesting because all of a sudden this might be something that you had in, in, in mind that was a really good target but no one else is backing you up on it. You have something in that information now that goes, hang on, what, what is that parameter? What does it mean to me? You can go back into tables of data, there'll be a whole lot of explainers that sort of say what, what those parameters are. And so I think we're really, you know, it's a bit cliche, but I think in terms of surface geochemistry, we're kind of <coughs> at a space where we can refresh and it's a sort of a, a new dawn. Um, and we've got the new project to sort of do that. So I'm going to just spruik my own project at the moment, but uh, it's uh, industry, le uh, industry led and there's a lot of industry involvement as well. But all the surveys are in on it too, or a lot of the surveys. And we're looking at developing new products and the new platform and making it very easy for people <coughs> to get at. Three years, multi-commodity. We're not just going to focus on gold and copper, so there is a, a really a strategic metals element to it as well. Um, and it's hopefully um, cost effective for either companies or um, SMEs in particular. So there's a lot of information online about that. Um, and I'll just yeah, close with reminding, you know, coming full circle or full you know, racetrack to just next time you're, you're going past the Mount Isa racetrack or something similar, I want you to think about um, you know, the, that there is ways we can do our geochemistry better and there are a lot more opportunities out there in, in shallow cover in particular. And as I said, thank, oh, thank, thank you for your time. And those are the, the QR codes, so if you use your smartphone, you can take a picture of those and, and get all the information you need. But thank you.